I'll, I'll pay for that one later on. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, anyway, as Al said, I've been writing about the city of Detroit for a long time, and there's so much happening um, right now in the city that I thought I'd just run through some slides for about 20 minutes or so and talk about what's happening both in the greater downtown and, and in the neighborhoods, and then use that to, to suggest a few areas that we can think about. Uh, so why don't we do the first slide? Uh, and what you see, um, Obvious, the most obvious thing happening is this incredible surge in construction and new development and revitalization in the greater downtown, uh, particularly with housing. Um, you know, no one was building housing in Detroit for many, many years of any kind. Um, and now we're seeing this incredible surge in new construction, uh, both the conversion of older buildings and also the, um, uh, you know, the ground up construction of new buildings. So this one is on the east side in the Lafayette Park District, it's called. Um, Ducharme Place, Ducharme is a little side street there. And this is just one of, a, you know, we don't, not even quite sure how many, depending on what you count, but 15 or 20 of these projects going up all over the greater downtown. Probably uh, about 1,000 units, uh, new apartments right now under construction, and another couple thousand or more uh, in planning that will start construction uh, soon, uh, this year and next year certainly. So um, sometime in the next five years, we'll be adding three to 5,000 new apartments, uh, which would translate into 3,000 to 5,000 or six or 7,000 new residents just in that greater downtown, midtown uh, area. Why don't you cycle through a couple, couple slides there? Uh, that's what it'll look like when it's done. Uh, next one. This is an older building that was uh, converted recently into, uh, into new housing. There's a lot of this uh, kind of thing happening too. Uh, this was a very dilapidated building in Midtown, uh, 711 Alexandrine, uh, in which, uh, you know, the top floor was not usable because the roof leaked and there were bed bugs and rats and, and uh, the, uh, but they did house people uh, who could not afford anything else, $400 a month for an apartment. Uh, and those people were relocated um, with the help of the developer and subsidies from, from Midtown and J.P. Morgan Chase. And, and a lot of people. So this, so some of this is happening where people are being displaced, uh, but so far the displacement has been uh, fairly uh, uh, minor and the people have been relocated with assistance. Uh, obviously the issue of gentrification is a real hot issue in Detroit, although so far there hasn't been a lot of actual displacement. There's been a lot of fear of displacement, but we may see more of it in the future and that's, that's I think what the issue is, that, that there's something like 2,000 units of what's called HUD Section 8 housing for seniors in the immediate downtown, midtown, uh, who's, where the contracts expire over the next several years. So, so that's gonna be a real issue. What happens to the seniors who are living here, who are living only on Social Security and don't have any other options? What happens to those people? Uh, they, they have a lot of rights under the, uh, under the law, state and federal law, uh, about how they get relocated and what kind of aid they're supposed to get. But still, it's gonna be a big issue and it's obviously traumatic when people do get displaced. This though was one of the more successful ones. Why don't you go to the next slide, please? Uh, on the left, you see um, Mayor Duggan. Uh, the man in the middle is Jamie Dimon, the CEO of uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, and Sue Mosey, the woman on the right, uh, who as we refer to her as the mayor of Midtown. Uh, she's head the, headed the group Midtown Detroit Inc. for the last 30 years and, and it's done just an incredible job. One of the most successful uh, nonprofit civic group leaders, uh, certainly in Detroit and almost anywhere. The stuff that she's been able to accomplish in Midtown um, is really pretty remarkable. Uh, why don't you go ahead? Uh, this is uh, one of Sue's projects. It's called the Strathmore. It's an old hotel from the 1920s that has been vacant for many years. It's about to reopen uh, as affordable housing. Uh, what, the, what we call affordable refers to a level of income uh, that is about 80% of the, of the metro-wide uh, um, median income. Uh, so this is not working class or poor, you know, poor people or subsidized housing, but it's for people sort of the lower, you know, maybe the uh, upper working class or lower middle class or people starting out or something like that. You still need, you know, let's say 25 to 30,000 a year uh, to live here. So this is not going to be where the, you know, the lawyers and bankers live, but, you know, you could have students, you could have, you know, service people that kind of stuff. But this is an example of the kind of project that's being done a lot. Uh, why don't you go ahead? Um, this one, of course, is uh, right on the East River front. Uh, it's called Orleans Place. Now, this is gonna initially be about 270 
uh, units of various uh, sizes and various uh, uh, price points. Uh, rental housing at this point. Uh, interestingly, projects like this take a long time to get to the point of groundbreaking. This probably took five years to get to the point where they could um, uh, you know, break ground and start construction. Endless sort of delays uh, with financing, with environmental problems, with the land, uh, you know, recovering from the Great Recession. I mean, endless, endless sort of red tape to get to this point. But once they do get to groundbreaking, it goes up pretty fast. And so this thing has gone up like mushrooms just in the last few months. And it should open, if not late this year, then early next year. And eventually you'll see, you know, several hundred people living here. Uh, this project and others, the city requires them to set aside about 20% of their units as affordable. And again, what is affordable uh, is sometimes a question. Again, this is not for the for the senior citizens who can't afford uh, more than you know four or five hundred a month. This is more sort of working class, getting into the you know lower middle class price range. But they are making an effort to you know to include a range of people so it doesn't all just get priced up. Why don't you go ahead? Uh, this is what it'll look like uh, when they get done. Um, notice very walkable. Um, you know, low rise, a mix of uh, residential and retail. Uh, they're really trying to create neighborhoods and not just a development here. Uh, this is not sort of gated communities like uh, uh, a lot of cities have in which Detroit did build back in the 80s with Harbor Town and so on where you had a gated community with high priced condos. They're definitely trying to build uh, walkable neighborhoods with a lot of attractions, a lot of retail. Uh, and all the new projects being done are being done on sort of this model right now. Uh, why don't you go ahead? Uh, now this is one of the really uh, uh, high priced ones. This is on Woodward Avenue. It's known as the Scott. Uh, this is, um, uh, and, and I don't know what their allocation for affordable is, but the high priced units, the ones on the corner uh, on the upper floors, are going to go for $3,000 a month. Uh, you know, three bedroom, uh, you know, large, large units. Um, so prices have been up, uh, have been bid up very quickly in and around the downtown. Um, you know, the, the rental rates range from, used to be about a dollar to a dollar 25 per square foot. So again, you could get units, you know, a small studio for four or $500 a month. Now they're about two bucks a square foot. So even the small ones, you know, go for seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars a month. And the supply is not meeting demand. There's so many uh, young people, mostly young sort of working, uh, you know, university educated, working for Dan Gilbert or somebody like that moving downtown, that, there, that there's really a shortage of supply at this point, hence the construction boom. Uh, go ahead. And uh, this, is, of course, is the Book Cadillac Hotel on the left, and on the right is the parking garage, and the construction on top is at some high-end condos, I'm sorry, high-end rental apartments that are going in on top of the garage. This, is a, this was a project that was planned before the Great Recession and the crash. It was supposed to be high-end condominiums, uh, and then that fell apart because of the crash. Uh, they had ordered the steel. They had to send all the steel back. The project was dead, but the developers stuck with it. Uh, they're Detroit-based, Detroit-located developers, and they came back, and now it's going in as relatively high-end uh, apartments uh, on top of this. So again, new things happening all over the place. And uh, one more, please. Next one. And this is Dan Gilbert's latest thing in Brush Park that we wrote about Sunday in the paper. This is going to be 400 new units, uh, 100 uh, for sale, 300 for rent, 20% uh, affordable units, most of which are in a senior uh, building, uh, senior citizen uh, building. Uh, but very modern architecture, a lot of uh, rooftop terraces, a lot of greenways, and some retail. So again, they're making, a, and the city is part of this, making a very conscious effort to do neighborhoods and not just, you know, gated, gated communis, communities. So this is something that's supposed to drop into the Brush Park District north of downtown and become a real uh, neighborhood where people can age in place. They have uh, cheaper apartments for young folks, then they have for sale units that they can buy as they start to have a family, and then they have a senior building where they can retire into. So whether anybody actually does that cycle over 30 or 40 years, we'll see, but that's, that's the idea. All right, go ahead. And of course, a lot of it, a lot of what's happening downtown is because of this man, Dan Gilbert, um, founder of Quicken Loans, uh, supposedly worth about $5 billion, according to Forbes magazine latest uh, uh, estimate. Uh, those estimates are pretty bogus, I think, but he, he's obviously worth a lot of money. 
um, owns uh, 90 buildings in downtown Detroit. Uh, his Quicken Loans is the second or third largest mortgage lender in the country. He owns the Cleveland Cavaliers basketball team, which I guess just won the other night, right? So they're, uh, they're, they're, they st they're, they're a game behind in the NBA playoffs, but he owns several casinos, Greektown Casino, uh, two casinos in, or casinos in Cleveland and Cincinnati and in Atlantic City. Uh, he's bidding for Yahoo, the internet service. So he's obviously one of the wealthiest men in America, and he has really done an amazing job in Detroit uh, in just five years. He moved downtown in 2010 from the suburbs. He brought 1,400 people with him. Now he's got about 12,000 working downtown. So downtown is completely filled up with these educated young, young folks. And it's sort of amazing if you spend a lot of time in downtown Detroit to walk around the heart of downtown now and see all these young folks you know, going to work in t-shirts and jeans and you know, tattoos and everything. You know, the whole, the whole millennial scene is really sort of interesting um, and different, different than what it has been. Uh, pardon me, there's the controversy. Um, of course, Dan has a very uh, elaborate security system for his buildings. He's got cameras everywhere, and that's created uh, a lot of controversy. They think it's sort of big brotherish that, you know, his cameras are watching all of us all the time. Uh, I think, you know, we're all on camera all the time. Anyway, in public now, there's cameras everywhere, and I don't think we should be surprised, uh, surprised at that. Um, he's got a privately held business. It's not a public corporation like Ford or GM, so we don't, know the, we don't know the financials of his company. We don't know really how well he's doing, although obviously he's making lots and lots and lots of money. Um, so there are some issues, and, and you know, should one guy control as much as Dan Gilbert does? I mean, that's an issue that's raised a lot. But I don't think you can say it's any, been anything uh, uh, but positive and even just remarkable about how much has happened um, so fast. Go ahead. Um, one thing he's doing, he's trying to bring in a lot of high-end retail uh, downtown to sort of recreate the retail scene that was in Detroit for so many years and began to disappear about 30 years ago when Hudson's closed. Uh, this is John Barbados. It's a very high-end men's store uh, from New York. The man, John Barbados, is from Detroit originally, has his very high-end men's store in New York. This is where you pay, you know, whatever, $150 for a t-shirt, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, but Gilbert is not going for just the you know, the Dunkin' Donuts and, and the McDonald's downtown. He wants these sort of unique um, sort of destination style retail places like, for example, Shinola, which is not his, but uh, Shinola and um, you know, some of the others. Uh, Nike recently opened a store, one of its stores downtown. And so retail is returning, uh, especially sort of the entertainment style retail, the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the bars, the coffee shops, the nightclubs, the high-end restaurants, a lot of amazing high-end restaurants have opened. Go ahead. And he's also doing a lot of uh, really unusual public special events, like this was a charity event to rappel down the side of one of his office buildings, the First National Building. And so, he, you know, you pay $1,000 and you get, get to do this. Uh, I did not do it myself. Um, and not just because it cost 1000 bucks, but uh, when, when I saw this, and that, that of course, is Gilbert himself, and I, I, I asked him, I said, did, did you tell your wife and your insurance company you were doing this? Uh, so I don't know, he's, it's the kind of thing he does. Uh, go ahead. Uh, big big uh, question about, uh, uh, you know, big effort to replace the Ambassador Bridge with the new bridge, uh, the new Gordie Howe uh, International Bridge, which will break ground probably not for about another year. It's still in early construction stages, but, um, and so people wonder if it's ever gonna happen, but it, it takes a long time. But why don't you go ahead. This is uh, an image of what the new one might look like. This is known as a suspension bridge, the kind the ambassador bridge is. Uh, and the next slide, please. This is a um, you know, cable stayed bridge, uh, which is the more modern way to build these. And they haven't decided yet which way they're gonna go. Uh, my guess it'll probably be, be this way. There are certain advantages to building it this way. These towers will be as tall as the Renaissance Center. So uh, this will be, if they build it this way, this will be a major uh, presence on the skyline and really become one of those landmarks in Detroit. Uh, right now, they're, uh, they've, they're down to three finalists for, uh, as a team to build it. Uh, and they're going to put out the RFP, request for proposals from these three companies. Uh, they'll pick one by the end of the year or possibly in early uh, 2017, early next year. And then they'll start construction probably sometime next year, mid to late next year, 
and they hope to open by 2020 or 2021. So it's still a ways off, but it does seem to be actually happening. <clears throat> Go ahead, please. <clears throat> and of course the arena, if you've been downtown at all, uh, you know that this arena <clears throat> is uh, under construction. Uh, it's supposed to open in a little over a year. Uh, and it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. Why don't you, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, this is from about a month and a half ago. It's even further ahead now. The roof is mostly enclosed at this point. And uh, <clears throat> if you go ahead, you'll see that they're building all kinds of stuff around it, office space, housing, uh, parking decks, uh, hotels, uh, and various kinds of things. And one of the big uh, <clears throat> selling points for this project is that um, of course, we're paying for a lot of it. We're paying for roughly half of it through our taxes. <clears throat> and, and the payback is that Illich would pay, the Illich's family would pay for all this other stuff around it that they would generate all this other new development, hundreds of, of uh, uh, new apartments and retail and so on. Excuse me. Uh, go ahead. And this is Wayne State's new business school. Wayne State University is moving their business school down to this site. Uh, so this would be just north of the uh, arena. Uh, and again, this is part of the sort of the spin-off development that this project is supposed to bring. Uh, go ahead, please. Now, so, for, so much for, the, um, for downtown. We hear a lot in Detroit about downtown versus the neighborhoods <clears throat> and that, you know, everything's happening downtown, nothing's happening in, in the neighborhoods. Well, there is a real, you know, difference, but there are things happening in the neighborhoods, and one of which is the blight removal effort from, from the city of Detroit. So under uh, Mayor, Mayor Duggan, he has really uh, revitalized blight removal. We've torn down, under his watch, we've torn down something like about 6,000 of these blighted, burned out houses. <clears throat> and over the next uh, two years, he expects to tear down another 10,000 or so. So we're making a real dent on this. Now we, ha we started out with 80,000 uh, blighted buildings, blighted and abandoned buildings, and enjoyed 80,000 buildings and, a, and a, uh, somewhere around 80 or 100,000 vacant lots um, in addition. So uh, at least a third of the city, there's a, close to 400,000 parcels in the city. Thank you. Um, so at least a third of the city uh, by parcel uh, is either vacant and abandoned. So it's a huge, huge problem. And obviously it's one of the things that's held, one of the things that's held Detroit back for so many decades. But they're beginning, beginning to make a real dent in it. Um, through the blight removal. Uh, go ahead. Uh, this, is, this is the cover of their, uh, the, uh, Dan Gilbert led a task force to identify which properties are blighted and what needed to be done and how you might find the money for it. Go ahead. Uh, street lights are coming back on. Uh, you may have heard that for years Detroit had a problem with street lights. Uh, <clears throat> probably at any given night about 40% of the street lights were off in the city of Detroit for years, for years. Uh, so Jane and I live on East Jefferson, uh, you know, one of the main streets on the east side, and our lights would be off for months at months at a time. Um, but during the bankruptcy, they reorganized into a public lighting authority that has got it out of the <coughs> city proper and into a public authority, which is one of the solutions that's worked very well uh, for Detroit in the last 15 years to create a whole series of sort of public authorities, and conservancies, and nonprofit corporations to pick off pieces of of the task to build the river walk or to run Eastern Market um, or to do the Workforce Development Agency or to run the Historical Society. All these things have been spun off into their own, you know, nonprofit corporation public authority. And they did that with the public lighting system and it's worked very well. So most of the street lights are now back on in the city of Detroit. Next, please. And here's something that um, you know we can do individually. I mean, some of these things like creating a public lighting authority, you need the you need the cooperation of the state, city, county, federal government sometimes. But things like this, this individual beautification of lots, you can, we can do on our own. And in fact, people have done this all over Detroit. Uh, this is one out in Brightmore. Uh, some neighbors got together and created what they call a little butterfly garden, a little walking path and some, some, some flowers and so on. And uh, you know, there are neighborhood groups, block clubs, uh, doing this kind of thing all over the uh, all over the city. Uh, it can cost anywhere from nothing, uh, just some sweat equity and some volunteers uh, to you know, small amounts of money, $5,000, $10,000, some of which is available from foundations. Foundations are giving a lot of money to block clubs and, and, uh, and what the CDCs, community development corporations and faith-based organizations 
uh, to do this kind of work. Uh, go ahead. Um, and this is the uh, Hans tree planting, the Hans Farms, Hans tree planting operation. Hans is a businessman who uh, lives in the city and told the city he would like to um, buy a lot of its vacant land and create an urban farm. And it was very controversial, as you probably uh, know. Um, but they eventually sold him about 140 acres, about 2,000 vacant lots, and allowed him to plant trees. And so over the last two and a half years, he's planted something on the order of 20 to 25,000 trees in the city. Uh, by, by Just by perspective, Greening of Detroit, the Greening of Detroit Tree Planting Organization, typically would plant three to 5,000 trees a year. And Hans has done, uh, you know, close to 25,000 just in, in, uh, in two and a half years. Um, so, um, and here's all the volunteers who came out for planning day. So it's really pretty remarkable. Um, so this is one of the things that, that you see a lot of. I mean, a, a whole range of interesting stuff. Why, why don't we go ahead? Uh, and urban farming, of course, is really um, enormously popular in Detroit. And it's one of the things Detroit is known for around the world. Uh, it's urban agriculture. Uh, all cities have, ha you know, I've seen people grow food inside cities for a long time. You know, during the Great Depression and during World War II, the Victory Gardens. But Detroit beginning about 1990 really became known internationally for its urban gardens. This one is Earthworks Farm. This is the one that the uh, Capuchin Friars run, the Capuchin Soup Kitchen on the east side of Detroit. Probably one of the best run urban farms in the United States. People come from all over the world to see how they, how they do it here. And this is where they grow the food that goes into the soup kitchen uh, that the Capuchins run year round. And it's also where they grow a lot of the uh, seedlings and things that they give to other farmers from other parts of the city who come here for education. Uh, go ahead. Uh, here's another one. This is up in Brightmoor. Uh, very typical. Uh, you see the, uh, you're growing the food in boxes, raised, ra raised beds, because the soil has been compromised in a lot of Detroit neighborhoods. So they, they build these boxes and import fresh dirt and then grow the, uh, grow the crops in there. Go ahead. And this is an interesting one. This is, uh, these are greening of Detroit workers, and they're, they're sowing worms in this uh, vacant lot over on the east side, worms, because they, they will kind of aerate the soil. And this is an experiment to see if this uh, uh, makes the soil both uh, you know, uh, more suitable for growing, but also to, to get rid of standing water. water. We have a huge problem with uh, standing water in Detroit, all over Belle Isle. Uh, and in our streets and in a lot of neighborhoods because Detroit's very flat and also because the ground is very clay, clay just below the surface and so water doesn't have anywhere to go. And so uh, there's a lot of experiments to, uh, uh, to drain uh, water off parking lots and off, off streets into rainwater gardens um, and, and experiments like this to find ways to get the water to percolate down into the soil so we, you know, the soil dries out. So a lot of things like this. Go ahead. Uh, and indoor agriculture is happening a lot. This again is out in the Brightmore neighborhood. This is a, an old uh, warehouse factory type facility and this gentleman um, uh, just in the last year started this indoor farm where you have these racks set up and you, uh, you grow uh, vegetables uh, with indoor lighting and indoor uh, watering and you can now buy this stuff from artesian farms in Whole Foods downtown and in uh, Eastern Market and uh, probably in some of the restaurants around town. Um, I think that's my last slide for now. Is there anything? Okay, so let me just, um, now that we've had a brief look at what's happening, let me just talk about some of the, some of the issues. I mean, obviously one big issue is, uh, you know, who benefits from this amazing resurgence that we're seeing in Detroit? And there really is a resurgence. More has happened in the last, five to seven years in Detroit than happened in the 25 years before that. Um, but the question is who's, who's benefiting? Uh, obviously, uh, you know, the downtown property owners uh, who uh, either the new ones like Dan Gilbert or the ones who hung on to their buildings for a long time are seeing these great increases in property values. Um, condominiums in, in the Brush Park District that were built 10 years ago are now selling for uh, you know, that the, uh, four years ago sold for 100000 80 or $100,000 now go for $300,000. I mean, huge increases in property values. But who's, who's it benefiting? Is it just a handful of folks, you know, middle class folks in the downtown area? Or is it going to be the city, the city at large? Now, uh, the, the notion that it's all downtown and nothing in the neighborhoods, as I said, I think is 
is false. I think there are a lot of good things happening in the neighborhoods. Um, but there is a question that, that you know, a lot of the benefits have been concentrated downtown so far. And so we need to think about how to do that. Uh, the school situation remains the crisis. As Mayor Duggan said up on Mackinac uh, a week or so ago, it doesn't matter what we do on the riverfront, it doesn't matter what we do anywhere else if we don't fix the schools. And so um, that is a major issue that we're still facing. Uh, crime and gun violence is obviously a major issue. Economic development that is creating jobs in the neighborhood um, is a major issue. Senior housing is a major issue. Uh, so what can we do? Um, well, there's some things, as I said, that you, know, you can't do unless you're the governor or the mayor uh, or you know, in federal government. Uh, you know, the, the city's blight removal effort is being paid for largely by the federal government uh, through a program known as the Hardest Hit Funds. Uh, we've gotten well over $150 million from the feds to tear down vacant homes. So none of us have the power to, do, to, to affect that unless you're you know, the senator, somebody or other. Um, but things like uh, uh, you know, job programs, urban farms, senior housing, um, uh, you know, urban agriculture. I mean, there's a lot of things individuals can do, individuals and small groups of people and faith-based faith groups. Uh, can do stuff like that. So I, I think that um, the opportunity is there um, to, to always make a difference. I mean, there's no one who is powerless. There is no one who cannot not help, and there's no issue that cannot be improved without, uh, you know, uh, not be improved by some, uh, some attention and some work from, from people. Um, so I, I, with that, I'm, I'm just happy to answer any questions or hear thoughts or whatever, you, you know, whatever. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, traditionally, everything that got built, uh, the question was how many of the new units are paying full taxes to the city? Uh, traditionally, all, everything that got built got some kind of incentive, some tax incentive, um, because uh, the market was so bad for so long that you had to incentivize developers to do that. Excuse me. And in fact, most of these deals are still financed um, at least 50% by some kind of uh, what I call funny money deal, tax credits and... Uh, um, you know, conservation easements, weird, weird, weird financial tools that they use. Uh, Gilbert mostly does it on his own. That, that's interesting. But even there, the city gives him the land for free, so he'll build it. Um, you know, as I said, the arena got built 50% with tax money and 50% of Illich's own money. Uh, so um, a lot of the uh, condominiums and so on will not pay a full 100% tax rate for a while. Uh, and which, how much they pay and for how long depends on what kind of deal they got. Uh, those are slowly going away, those, those, those incentives, as the market improves and they don't need them as much. Uh, but still, most, most deals get some kind of incentive. So, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, the jail site, um, what do we do? Um, obviously, it was a fiasco from the beginning. Uh, well over $100 million cost overrun. Now, I don't know, uh, you know whose fault it was. I mean, that'll be, that'll, they'll work through that. At this point, uh, the question is, what's it gonna cost to, to build a new jail and criminal justice system? Is it cheaper where it is, you know, to start it over right there? Is it cheaper to move it to Mound Road? Probably not. Uh, it's probably cheaper to do it where it is, as, a, as expensive as that is. But are there other reasons to move it? Because that's not a very good site in terms of downtown revitalization to have a jail. I've always thought that was a terrible site for a jail. I'd much rather see it moved. Um, but where you move it and, and who pays for it? Uh, you know, the public pays for it, obviously. Um, and it's gonna be hundreds of millions of dollars some way that'll be on taxes for Wayne County residents. So. So I, I don't see any good answer to that, but I think that it does make sense to move it just to, um, just to, because that, that's a major entrance to, to downtown and grash it, and it'd be better if it's something else than besides a jail. So, yes, okay. Yes, please. Uh, no, the, it, it's interesting. I hear that question a lot, and the rumors usually Dan Gilbert's trying to buy it, and I don't think Dan Gilbert's trying to buy it. 
but uh, evidently, uh, just based on the, the amount of questions and rumors, my guess is that it's being shopped around to somebody. Um, but what happens to it? Who buys it? Um, does somebody want to buy it and go upscale? You know, replace everybody? I don't know. But there are a lot of questions, a lot of rumors about those homes. But no work. I'm sorry? But no definitive work on exactly what's going to be happening. No, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. No, all I said, all I'm hearing are questions and rumors at this point. Yes? Yep. Yeah, and the Regional Transit Authority. Well, I think Detroit badly needs regional transit. We're the only major city in the country that doesn't have it. And a lot of cities like Denver and, and uh, uh, Houston have added these light rail systems in recent years, and I think they've done a lot of good. Um, they lead to a lot of new development. And in Detroit, it's really critical that, that working class service people who live in the city get to their jobs. And it is really awful what has to happen. Um, Last year, we wrote at the paper, we wrote about the walking man, the man who walked 18 miles a day. That, that's an extreme case, but it's not at all un, un, unusual that people will spend two or three hours a day uh, on this dysfunctional bus system that we have trying to get to and from work. So I think uh, anything that improves that system is really um, a matter of not just convenience, but, but of economic development and really of, of social justice. Uh, there's a great quote from, uh, the former mayor of Turin, Italy, uh, in a documentary that, that I was part of, uh, where they added all kinds of mobility. And he said, in any city, mobility is a civic right. If you live in a city, you have a right to get around, a right to get to your job. And so I, I would support the regional transit vote in November, and I think, I think that'll help a lot. So. Yes, what else? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, the position that Mayor Duggan and the Detroit delegation took was the right one, that you, ne you need to not just bail out the debt of the Detroit public schools, but you need to have some uh, school board, basically, uh, they were calling the Detroit Educational Commission, that can oversee where schools are built and, uh, and what schools open and close. Because right now, what you have is a charter system uh, that's come in and trying to pick off you know, the best locations and the best students, regardless of what impact it has on Detroit public schools. And some of the charters are great, some of them are bad, some Detroit public schools are great, some are bad. But you need, I think you need this, this central school board type body that would, that would have some control over, you know, what's opening and what's closing. And, and the, the recent legislation that the governor is signing does not do that. It bails out financially, but it, there's, there's no sense that it's gonna address any of the basic, the basic problems. So, uh, you know, only about half the kids in the city go to public school now. The rest go to charters and academies of various kinds. So it's a big problem, but I don't think the legislation that just passed addresses it. Okay. Um, if not, I think that you're now breaking into groups for, I'm sorry, you're giving me smoke signals here. What am I? What? Questions? Oh. Oh, okay, okay, sure. Um, sure, thank you. Uh, some questions for you to discuss. Um, well, I think the question, you know, the base, what can any of us do um, in Detroit? Now, you can obviously live there, you can shop there, um, you can volunteer. There's a million ways to volunteer. You can do urban gardens, you can help seniors. Uh, there's a lot of things, but one question, what, what can you do? And what can your churches do? What can your, you know, your organizations do? Um, that's one. And um, the other big question in Detroit is, um, you know, the regional uh, relationship between the city and suburbs. It's one thing, you know, if you live in the city and you have a church in the city, you know, you work right there. I mean, you, you plow your own garden, right? Um, and if you're from the suburbs, uh, maybe it's a different answer. Uh, uh, so what do you do? So I would, I would ask about um, that. Um, I also think we also have to, um, uh, you know, uh, Sheila Cockwell, the former city councilwoman, said the other day that, uh, you know, race and race relations is the 900 pound unspoken thing in any discussion between the city and the suburbs. So I think we need to still talk about racial justice in the city. We're coming up on Detroit 1967, the 50th anniversary of the uh, uprising in the city. 
And what's the legacy of that? And, and, and one, maybe you can talk just, how are you gonna think about that over the next year, year and a half? There's gonna be a million discussions and seminars and articles about that. How should we, how should we deal with that? Uh, you know, some people say we haven't made any progress at all. Well, that's clearly not true, but we'd still need more to go, right? So, so what do we do about that? Um, and, uh, you know, how do we relate to our political system? Uh, are we happy with, uh, you know, the, the way our political system is run and does it address the problems it needs to address or not? Uh, so any of those kind of issues are fair game, I would think. Okay? Okay, well, thank you very much.